नमस्ते दिस इज सीए संकल्प सो हियर कम्स एफएम थियोरी फॉर थ्री चैप्टर्स मर्जर्स एंड एक्विजिशन इंटरनेशनल फाइनेंशियल मैनेजमेंट इंटरेस्ट रेट रिस्क मैनेजमेंट वन आर अप्रोक्सीमेटली ट्वेंटी मिनट्स पर टॉपिक एंड इफ यू हैव योर मैजिक बुक दैट्स वेर आई विल बी टेकिंग इट फ्रॉम इफ यू डोंट देन इन दैट केस यू विल हैव योर मॉड्यूल दैट इज आल्सो एब्सोल्युटली ओके सो दिस इज द थ्री चैप्टर्स व्हिच वी विल कवर व्हिच अकॉर्डिंग टू मी कैन बी आस्क्ड इन द एग्जाम फॉर अप्रोक्सीमेटली 5 टू 6 मार्क्स इन एमसीक्यू सो नाउ द रिलेवेंस ऑफ एमसीक्यू हैज इंक्रीज्ड सो वी हैव टू डू इट फ्रॉम द एमसीक्यू पर्सपेक्टिव आल्सो एंड फ्रॉम द थ्योरी पर्सपेक्टिव आल्सो दे कैन आस्क इन थ्योरी आल्सो सो आई विल जस्ट गिव अ क्विक रश थ्रू will not get into the details it's a revision session we don't have enough you don't have enough time as well so i'll try to explain as much as possible but some things are purely theory we have not done it practically as per the icai schedule but let's try and cover it in the maximum way possible such that if any question comes in the exam we will be able to crack it okay so chalo first we will start with which chapter mergers and acquisitions then ifm then irrm chal sure. so let's start with the mergers and acquisitions let's move on so three concepts to understand here merger acquisition and corporate restructuring what is merger now see in the indian context merger is called as a plus b is equal to ab limited the best example being exxon mobil so exxon an oil company got merged with mobil an oil company exxon mobil became the world's best highest you can say oil producers throughout the globe then acquisition acquisition means when a company acquires b limited and b limited loses its existence and a limited remains the way tata acquired the air india yes so when tata airlines acquired air india now air india is not in existence it is tata airlines so that basically is called as a acquisition and then we have corporate restructuring that something happened in vodafone so vodafone was first primarily called as hutch and then first it was called orange then came hutch then voda it was taken over by vodafone then idea was an independent entity then there was a merger between vodafone and idea then they did some corporate restructuring i'll explain so now this is what in the indian context merger acquisition and corporate restructuring means so what is merger amalgamation of two entities to form a single entity is called merger uh, you have to tell me in comments any other companies where merger has happened in the indian context so exxon corporation and mobil corporation first and second largest oil producers of usa announced their merger became exxon mobil next the act of overtaking something and acquiring it to be yours is called acquisition tata group and air india uh, tata group acquired air india uh, tata is the acquirer company okay and then corporate restructuring this is what happened with vodafone i told you all from orange to hutch to vodafone to idea merger vodafone idea and then they see they also did a external restructuring with the government of india there is something called as agr dues which are to be paid by the telecom company to the government of india so say for example 50000 crores was to be given by vodafone in india to government of india so they told that we don't have 50000 crores instead we will give you equity shares of our company so today government of india is a shareholder of vodafone india and that's how the system approach that was basically a way of external restructuring done by the company there are also internal restructurings they are strategically alliance with a lot of other companies as well in terms of research and development uh, demergers etc so corporate restructuring is the process of reorganizing company's management finances operations basically to ensure that there is efficiency and effectiveness of the company so this is about your merger acquisition and corporate restructuring we move on to the types of merger for sure expect a mcq if i was the paper setter i will definitely set a mcq in this context i will explain all of this with my personal examples and you also please keep the magic book or a pen paper ready so that you can write those examples during the exam 
revision you just have to remember those examples you will be able to manage the mcq first is horizontal merger horizontal line means what this this is called as horizontal means everything is on the same line so say for example company a is there company b is there there is a merger between a and b so both are at the same level this is called as a horizontal merger and vodafone idea was nothing but a horizontal merger kind of then uh, flipkart and mintra flipkart was also into a lot of fashion and everything uh, clothing all of that and mintra also into fashion clothing and everything so that was also basically flipkart and mintra merger was also a horizontal merger i hope we are clear merger of companies from the same industry and at the similar stage making it a near monopoly to avoid competition in that particular industry now today we all know that how uh, important the fashion brand mintra flipkart mintra have become next is called as the vertical merger as the name suggest a is here b is here right so there could be a backward integration or there could be a forward integration what it means means if i am acquiring a company which gives me my raw material that is called as backward integration and if i am acquiring a company which is my next level of operation that is called as a forward integration basically at i am acquiring a company at a different stage either at a raw material stage or at a more finished good stage is called as vertical integration if you acquire at a raw material stage backward integration if you acquire at a finished good stage it is called as a forward integration so it is a merger of companies of same industry but different stages your similar stage same industry here same industry different stage of production and distribution when a company acquires its retailers it is called as forward integration and when it acquires its suppliers it is called as a backward integration so a lot of uh, e-commerce industries have acquired the courier companies so that basically is called as a vertical merger so say for example amazon Amazon's work majorly is to distribute the goods throughout India, throughout the globe. So, if say if Amazon acquires a delivery, delivery uh, company which is into couriers, so it will be called as a vertical merger. Got it? Whether it will be a backward integration or forward integration, you have to comment and tell me. Next is called as conglomerate merger as in a merger which is not at all connected within the industry. So, here horizontal merger, same industry, same stage. Vertical merger, same industry, different stage. If it is a raw material stage, backward integration, uh, distribution stage, it is called as a vertical uh, forward integration. Conglomerate merger, no connection at all. The example could be of LNT and Voltas. So, LNT is totally into a different field altogether, and obviously, Voltas is also into a different field. Like uh, the best example that I can give you is when, say, Reliance entered into a joint venture with a Facebook. Now, obviously, Reliance is into manufacturing of oil and all of that, right? But it now took a great stake. That is the reason Mr. Mark Zuckerberg was there in the wedding of Mr. Anand Ambani, right? So, that is between a, a, a merger planning between a Reliance and Facebook is a conglomerate merger. Strategically, they may at a future date align but as of now, it is a conglomerate merger. So, it is a merger of unrelated industries. The catch word is unrelated industries. Mainly done for some non-strategic benefits like diversification or any other growth opportunity. So, there can be many non-strategic benefits for Mr. Mukesh Ambani that he will get a direct access to the Facebook level portal. Then we have co-generic merger. This is also very good. Now, this co-generic merger means you are acquiring a company which is connected to you in terms of your technology, in terms of your packaging. So, these are market product or technology extension merger. Mainly, they are technology extension mergers. So, uh, Facebook acquiring a WhatsApp, acquiring a 
Instagram. So Facebook knew that face, uh, WhatsApp and Instagram both are going to be the next technology thing. So it acquired both of them and they are all now integrated. What was that? A co-generic merger. And then there is reverse merger. When a smaller company acquires a larger company. So how is it possible? Tata did it. Tata was sixth largest. Tata Steel was sixth largest. But it acquired Chorus Steel which was third largest. So when a small company acquires a company which is bigger than itself, it is called as a reverse merger. When a large company is being acquired or taken over by a small company, it is called as a reverse merger. Many a times it also happens that private companies acquire some listed company called as reverse merger. So by default, that private company has entered into the stock market without the typical listing route, that IPO listing and all of that. Now not required because you are already owner of a company which is listed in the stock exchange. So that is also done at times for reverse merger though Indian uh, laws do not allow this uh, generally. So helps private company to pass the lengthy process of going to public. Tata Steel acquiring a chorus was the best example of a reverse merger. So I hope we are clear with the names horizontal merger, vertical merger, co-generic merger, unlimited Oh, sorry, conglomerate merger, unlimited, co-generic merger, technology extension, WhatsApp, uh, Instagram, all of that. Then reverse merger, Tata, Chorus, right? Then comes the takeover. Takeover means acquiring a company, right? So that basically is called as a takeover. Again, I'll give you examples here. You will be able to easily remember all of them. First is called as a street sweep where acquiring company accumulates a large number of shares and then makes an offer. The other company has no option but to accept it because you have acquired so many shares. And this is what happened in case of uh, NDTV acquisition by Adani. So Adani acquired more than 40% shares in NDTV. Poor NDTV had no choice but to get acquired. So what was that? It was a street sweep. Right? So, when acquiring company Adani accumulates large number of shares in NDTV and then makes an offer the target company has to agree and left with no choice. Then, second, bear hug. When the acquirer threatens the target company to make an offer, open offer, the board of target company agrees to a settlement with the acquirer for change of control. So, for example, say Reliance Retail Ventures Private Limited, Re Reliance enters into a lot of bear hugs. So it will threaten you, threaten the target company, come on, get acquired. You have no choice when Reliance is asking something. So say for example, a brand Biba, Reliance Retail Ventures Private Limited wants a lot of brands within its umbrella of Reliance Retail Ventures. So it will tell the board of directors of Biba company, come on, get acquired. So you have no option. So when the acquirer threatens the target company to make an open offer, the board has of the company agrees to a settlement. Then is a strategic alliance involving involves disarming the acquirer by offering a partnership rather than a buyout. So now here you are just asking for a partnership. Let's become partner. Once you become a partner internally, you will become so strong that by default, then you will acquire that company itself. So it starts with a strategic alliance. But because one company is so strong or big enough that eventually it will take over strategic okay then comes something called as a brand power so now suppose if there is a big brand which tells that boss i want to acquire you the smaller brand will have no option it also happens in a lot of perfume brands that they use the brand power or fashion brands use this brand power so say if i start a, a clothing company sankal clothing company i start doing good but Zara comes and tells Mr. Sankal, I am I'm ready to acquire your company which is worth 10 crores for 50 crores. Brand power, Zara will acquire me. Game over. Right? So, there are four types here. Street sweep, NDTV Adoni, uh, Bear Hug, Reliance Retail to Biba, Strategic Alliance, uh, small companies getting strategically aligned with bigger companies and then bigger companies eventually taking over them and brand power when Zara acquires Sankalp's clothing brand. Done. So street sweep, bear hug, strategic alliance, brand power. These are the four types of takeover. Chalo, moving on 
to the defensive tactics so defensive tactics is like the target company is trying to acquire you but you do not want to get acquired so what are the defensive tactics that you are going to use first is called as divest teacher means spin off certain important business as a separate legal and a separate company or a entity say for example uh, i have a company say webucate okay in webucate yeah webucate in webucate we have a division say of books say of uh, video lectures say of test series so three verticals we have okay now somebody wants to acquire the whole brand webucate for 50 crores what i will do is i will create three different brands now i will create a different brand for video lectures sankal kanstia video lectures for test series i will create another brand number one test series for books i will keep webucate as a brand now the acquirer will not be invest interested in acquiring webucate as a brand because earlier it had all three at one place now for video lectures that's a separate entity for test series as a separate entity so that is where divest teacher can help as a defensive tactic right how because it does a spin off of important business then there is crown jewel selling of companies most lucrative assets so suppose if there is a very big uh, company which is trying to acquire a small company right so that small company can sell some of its good assets uh, from its business so obviously the acquirer will now not be interested that is called as crown jewel but obviously the shareholders if it's a private limited company the shareholders will not allow the selling of most lucrative assets so practically crown jewel is not possible then is called as poison pill i'll give you an example for poison pill poison pill you are taking poison by yourself this is what twitter uh, tried when elon musk was trying to acquire it so what is poison pill making yourself unattractive now suppose if some uh, female approaches me and says sir i want to marry you but i am already a married person so obviously i cannot marry i'm i'm living a happy married life so i will make myself unattractive i'll not bath for 20 days i'll be i'll not shave i'll wear ugly clothes and everything so i'll make myself unattractive now the acquirer will feel no no he's not a good person let's leave him he's a red flag so what i have done i have taken a poison pill now the acquirer will go target company relax so poison pill Sometimes an acquiring company, you know, when it is bidding for another company, the, the tactics used by, I'll say the target company to make itself unattractive to a potential bidder is called as a poison pill. Then comes the poison put. Uh, at times, a lot of companies issue convertible bonds. Okay. Suppose if there is an acquirer coming to take over a target but target doesn't want to get acquired what it will do is i will give convertible bonds now if i give convertible bonds and the acquirer company acquires the target those bonds will convert at a future date now the acquirer knows that when it converts it will have to give lot many equity shares to these converters there may be a lot of cash outflow or unnecessarily a lot of equity dilution may happen at a future date so that may result in the acquirer company not interested in the target company poison Put. So bonds are issued for cash in a higher price creates a high future cash drainage. Then is called as white knight and white square. Here if there is acquirer company which is planning to acquire the target but the target doesn't want to get acquired. What it will do is it will sell itself. Before the acquirer I will sell myself to some other company to some other company so here the target sales may just take to a friend company to avoid the takeover offer from the acquirer called as white knight however when a minority stake is sold to an uninterested company so that the target management can retain the control again it is called as white square so i will sell when the acquirer goes away i will repurchase it back that is called as white square selling a part of company forever so that now the acquirer doesn't have major interest in us white knight then is called as golden parachute so here what happens is the target company will make a agreement and write that if any takeover acquirer comes then in that case the management will get 100 crores as compensation 
So you are giving yourself a golden parachute that if somebody acquires you, you will still fly. So here the management of the com target compensate themselves with a hefty exit package in the event of takeover. Almost similar to green mail also. Target management offers the acquirer at a higher price to repurchase the shares bought by the re uh, acquirer company. So they will then increase the value of the shares and then the acquirer company may not acquire. Then there is Pac-Man defense. Pac-Man defense is the acquirer company is coming to acquire the target. The target company makes a counter offer and tells, hey acquire company, now I want to acquire you. What Tata Cora Steel did, uh, Tata Steel did to Cora Steel. So it is a strategy whereby the target makes a counter offer of buying the stake in the acquiring company. All right. So these are the defensive tactics. Divest teacher, crown jewel, poison pill, poison put, white knight, white square, green parachute, green mail, a golden parachute, green mail and Pac-Man defense can come in MCQ. So just be clear. So I hope with the example, you'll be able to manage it. So divest teacher, sell off a part of a company, Crown Jewel, sell off the major assets. Poison Pill, make yourself unattractive. Poison Put, give a convertible debenture. White Knight, sell it to a company. White Square, sell and then repurchase. Golden Parachute, give a good termination offer or a exit offer. Uh, Green Mail, almost similar points, sell at a very high price. Pac-Man Defense, give a target counter offer of buying the acquiring company. What is the intention behind the merger and acquisition? There could be many intentions. Operating efficiency can be done. Economies of scale. I can expand quickly. Like Flipkart when acquired Mintra. So it had a good expansion level. Diversification happens. Tax benefit happens. Uh, amalgamation results in tax benefits. Who better than you would know it? Uh, financial benefit increase in shareholders value. We have seen in this chapter of EPS and MPS increases post acquisition. Strategic benefit in terms of geographical location and different products. So this also happens that suppose you are at XYZ location. There is another company which is at ABC location. Now, if you merge, you by default have ABC plus XYZ locations. So that's where it helps. Then there is this concept difference between management buyout and leverage buyout. See, leverage buyout is simple. Leverage means debt. So you take a lot of debt and acquire a particular company. This is called as LBO, leverage buyout. Acquisition finance entirely by using borrowed funds. In this firm's physical assets are also acquired. How it is acquired? By borrowing money. Tata T acquired Tetley UK by taking 77% debt. LBO helps to increase the cash flow of the firm, thereby improving the operational efficiency and volume of sales. So this is about leverage buyout. If a question comes, you should be able to answer. And then comes MBO. Management buyout. Buyout is initiated by the management teams. At times, internal management buyout also happens. To so say, for example, Tata Motors is there. It requires a lot of steel for its motors manufacturing company. So, Tata Motors may buy out Tata Steel itself. Example. So, company is bought by its own management team, used for existing division, not part of core business. So, that is called as management buyout. Then, different parts of divestment or what you called as divest teacher first is sell off or partial sell off so if there is a part of a company which is not doing well what you will do you will sell it off suppose there is a company a there is a division a and there is division b division a is making 10 crores profit division b is making 2 crores loss so what is happening so, so let's write this here division a is making 2 crores profit Division B is making 2 crores loss. What will you do? Eventually, at consolidation level, you are making 0 profit. So, what you will do? You will sell off. You will sell off. What you will sell off? You will sell off B. Now, at least you are making 2 crore profit. Right. Sale of an asset or factory or division product line or subsidiary. Getting rid of an unwanted subsidiary. Unwanted subsidiary. Right. Sell offs also helps to raise cash. Yes. Done. Then. Then is spin off. A part of the business is separated and created as a separate firm. Can you give me an example of spin-off which has recently happened in Tata's? Tata Motors has 
divided Tata Motors into two segments. One is commercial vehicle and uh, commercial vehicle like tractors and everything. And the other is consumer vehicles like the ones like uh, uh, say Tata Manza and all of that. The typical Tata vehicles. So it has done a spin-off. Part of business is separated and created at a separate firm. Existing shareholders of the firm get proportionate ownership and this is what happened. Tata Motors got divided. The Suppose I am a Tata Motors holder, 100 shares. I will get 100 shares in Tata Commercial. I will get 100 shares in Tata uh, Consumers as well. So that's about spin-off. You can write here Tata Motors. Tata Motors divided it into two parts now. Now then there is split-off. So split-off means obviously breaking up the entire into a series of spin-off. So say I had uh, say main company or head company say Reliance is majorly now it is doing a split up. Previously there was only one company RIL Reliance Industries Limited. Now it has Geo Financial, Reliance Industries Limited then uh, there are other verticals also coming up of Reliance. So they are entering into a multiple spin offs resulting into a split up. Again I am telling you spin off Tata Motors divided into two. Split up Reliance dividing itself into various more entities. So multiple spin-offs is split up. Involves breaking up the entire firm into a series of spin-off by creating separate legal entities. Parent firm no longer exists and only newly created entities survive. So Reliance Industries now will divide. Reliance Oil, Geo, Reliance Retail Ventures, Private Limited, all of that. Then there is equity carve-outs. Almost similar. Strategic avenue or uh, where a parent firm may take one of its subsidiaries, which is growing faster and carrying higher valuation. So suppose I am into two, three businesses, but one of the business is doing very good. So I will do an equity carve out. It I will carve out that entity, ask a higher valuation for that and then sell it accordingly. As I told you, say video lectures, books, test series, but I'm doing very good in uh, video lectures, books and test series is mediocre. So what I will do is I will carve out a separate entity for video lectures, demand a higher valuation for that and sell it off. So carve out is a strategic avenue where a parent firm may take one of its subsidiaries which is growing faster, carrying higher valuations than other businesses owned by the parent. Carve out generates cash because shares in subsidiary are sold to the public. So then I will sell that part to the public. So that are the four ways of divestiture, sell off, partial Spell off, sell off unwanted subsidiary, 2 crore, 2 crore, 2 crore profit, 2 crore loss, 2 crore loss, sell, spin off, Tata Motors, Tata Commercial and Tata Consumer, split up, series of spin offs, equity carve outs, verificate, video lectures, doing good, carve out, sell higher, others, okay, okay. Then reverse stock split. So what is reverse stock split? One is stock split, suppose share value of my, say for example, MRF is a share which is valued at rupees 1 lakh in the stock exchange right you would know it if not you can check out write down mrf share price it is more than 1 lakh rupees now it is not possible to purchase that 1 lakh share for everybody so what usually companies do they reserve they do a stock split so they will divide that shares into multiple number of shares same value multiple number of shares so uh, uh, infosys wipro reliance uh, they have done it a lot of time, Tata's. So, 100 rupee shares is split into 10 shares of 10 each. Now, if a new investor wants, they can purchase 10 rupee shares. Right. So, that is called as stock split. What is reverse stock split? Suppose the shares, company shares are 10 rupees. What they will do is they will consolidate and make it 50 rupees. So, suppose if I have 10 shares of 10 each, so we will uh, do a reverse stock split. So now they will make the share price 50. So instead of 10 shares of 10 rupees each, now I will have 50 share, uh, 2 shares of 50 rupees each. Okay. So 10 shares at the rate 10 is the current situation. I will do a reverse stock split. How is the reverse stock split going to happen? I will consolidate the shares and instead of 10 rupees per share, I will make it 50 rupees per share. Now, instead of 10 shares, I will have 2 shares. That is called as reverse stock split. Reverse stock split is a process by which a company decreases the number of shares outstanding. Previously, I had 10 shares. Now, I will have 2 shares of 50 each. Previously, I had 10 shares of 10 each. By combining current shares into a fewer or lesser number of shares. 
For example, in a 5 is to 1 reverse split, a company would take back 5 shares and will replace them by 1 share. Okay. Reverse split will not result in change in market value, but it results in increase in share price. Now, suppose if there is a penny stock, that is a company which will want to avoid the tag of penny stock, it will do a reverse split. Avoid delisting from stock exchange. At times, there are stocks whose value is just 3 rupees, 4 rupees in the stock market. The SEBI may want to delist it. <clears throat> it will do a reverse stock split. The price will increase. It will not be delisted. Uh, avoiding removal from constituents of index. Similar point. To attract institutional investors and mutual funds <coughs> who want to invest in a company which has a higher potential. So, that's about the reasons for reverse stock split. And the last is cross-border MNA is popular for global growth. So, what are the major factors for cross-border MNA? Is globalization of products and distribution. Obviously, your products are now globally known. Integration of global economy is almost same point. Helps you in expansion of investment relationships at international level. So, Infocys or Make My Trip, these are all globally known brand. Many countries are reforming their economic and legal systems, providing generous investment and tax incentives. So, a lot of countries like Mauritius and all of that, Dubai, allow you to set up companies, Singapore allow you to set up companies outside and give you tax benefits. So, that becomes lucrative for the companies. Privatization of state-owned enterprises, consolidation of banking industries, banking also can get expanded. So, that is where it is helpful, cross-border MA. So, these are the major theory points, practically we have already covered, of mergers and acquisitions which can be asked as MCQ or in theory, at least revise it two, three times till the exams and you will be able to manage it for sure. Okay, so now we move on to the next chapter and that chapter is International Financial Management. So, let's start again a very important chapter from MCQ uh, and theory point of view. Let's start. So, the first question is what is an ADR, GDR, very high probability of again coming in the examination. Now, what exactly are depository receipts? Suppose I have a company like say for example, Infosys is there. Infosys has already done an IPO initial public offer in India. Now it wants more money. So it has two options. Either go for a FPO or a right share issue within the country itself or it can also issue the shares outside India say in United States of America or any other country. If it, stay, if it issues shares in United States of America, it will be called as a American depository receipts. If it is uh, issued in some other country say London, or uh, in other parts of Europe, then it will be called as a GDR, Global Depository Receipt. Anywhere other than in USA, it will be called as a GDR. Now, what exactly is a depository receipt? So, Infosys needs more money. It will issue shares outside India. Now, when it is issuing shares outside India, it cannot issue like a normal procedure in India because in India, you are governed by the Companies Act. So, you will follow your procedure. But outside India, you have to follow the procedure of that particular country. So, what will happen is Infosys will issue shares. Those shares will be converted into depository receipts by the overseas participant in that particular country. So, say for example, America. So, Infosys will issue 1 lakh shares to the depository participant in America. That American depository participant will convert those shares into depository receipts. It can also convert one depository receipt into equal to five shares. Okay. So, that is how the conversion is done. One depository receipt is made. Those depository receipts are then listed on the New York Stock Exchange or a Luxembourg Stock Exchange as the case may be. And then the particular investors of that country can purchase shares of Infosys through those depository receipts. Because those depository receipts have been converted by the overseas depository participant, the local public there, which are foreign institutional investors for us, they will have a security that, okay, all of this is being done in a transparent manner. I hope we are clear with the whole process. So, let me explain you with an example again. So, here 
Infosys wants to issue more, wants funds. So if it need funds, it will issue shares. But now it is planning to issue shares outside India. So what it will do is Infosys will give shares to a local depository participant in India, which will go to the ODP overseas depository participant. This overseas depository participant will convert shares to depository receipts. Deposit, yeah, depository receipts. This depository list, uh, rece receipts will be listed in the stock exchange of that particular country. And then the local investors can purchase the shares through the depository receipt. So now what will happen? Investors will pay money, get the depository receipts. This money will then be con given to uh, overseas depository participant. From there, it will come to the depository participant in India. And finally, Infosys will get the money. If these shares are being, these depository receipts are being issued outside in, uh, in America, it is a ADR. Otherwise, it is a GDR. Infosys has issued ADR in New York Stock Exchange. Access Bank has issued a GDR in probably Luxembourg Stock Exchange. Other than USA, it is GDR issued with an objective of fundraising outside its own domestic country. Okay. ADRs are issued to raise funding and list its shares in US dollars. Infosys shares converted to depository receipts in their particular currency and then listed in New York Stock Exchange. Indian custodian transfers its company securities to the depository in USA. USA depository issues ADRs to the investor in USA based on Indian securities within its custody. US dollar received by selling of ADR is transferred to the Indian company. Traded on NAS New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ as the case may be. ADRs are obviously denominated in US dollars because the US investors are going to purchase this. Major demand of GDR. Now we come to GDR. Same process. Raise funds except in USA. Right. Indian cus uh, custodian offers its securities to deposit where it needs to get listed. So UK or Singapore as the case may be. Same process, UK issues GDRs to the investors in that particular country. UK pound is received, transferred to the Indian company. London Stock Exchange is where it can get itself listed. GDRs are denominated in wherever country it is listed. Major demand of GDR is in UK, USA, Southeast Asia and Europe. So I hope we are clear with the whole process of ADR, GDR. If it comes in the exam, you should be able to crack it. Then comes the foreign currency convertible bonds. The first thing is we should know what is a convertible bond. Do we know what is a convertible bond? The answer is yes. So convertible bond means today it is a bond. At a later point in time, it will be converted into equity shares. Right. But as the name suggests, this is a FCCB. So it is a foreign currency convertible bond. So if say Infosys wants to issue convertible bonds, but it does not want to issue it in the domestic market. It wants to issue it in the foreign market. It will issue FCCB. Again, I'm telling you, I am a company. I want to issue convertible bond in my country. I will come up with convertible bonds, but I want to issue convertible bonds outside my country. Okay. Then I will issue FCC. So same convertible bonds, but denominated in foreign currency issued outside India will be called as a FCCB. Suppose Infosys issues a convertible bond in US dollars, foreign currency. It will be a FCCB that is convertible bonds issued in a currency other than issuers domestic currency. Convertible mix between debt and equity. So you will get a regular coupon like a debt when it is converted. The value of equity will increase and that's what the advantage of convertible bonds are. Advantage, flexibility to convert into equity or redeem the bond. This is an advantage of by default convertible bonds. Uh, allow dilute, delay dilution of equity. So I will get the funds also and my dilute, uh, equity will be diluted at a future date. Easy to market on account of dual features because it has fixed coupon also later conversion also of equity. It's a dual benefit. But this advantage is that there is a risk of foreign exchange fluctuations because it is a foreign currency denominated bond. Interest rates are usually limited because outside uh, the, our country, the rates are limited as such. Then comes the concept of netting. Very important concept. If you have seen the MTP part 2 of May 24 attempt, then you will get a practical question on netting. But it's easy. It is very much solvable. I will definitely be making a video on that also on the whole MTP. But, you know, before... 
solving that question, you should know what exactly a netting, the concept of netting is. So now I am going to teach you netting. What is netting as the name suggests? Netting of. So there is a, here, see here. There is an investor who owes dollar twenty five thousand to B. There is an investor B who owes dollar one lakh to A. So what they will do instead of A transferring to B, then B transferring to A, they will net off and B will transfer only dollar seventy five thousand. B will transfer only dollar seventy five thousand to A. Seventy five thousand to A. So with this, what happens is A's transaction cost are saved. A will feel that okay, honestly, I don't have to incur any transaction cost, foreign currency conversion cost, and all of those things. Transaction time is saved, and the matter is also settled. So what we discussed here is called as netting, also called as bilateral nettings, where only two parties are involved, A and B. But if there are multiple parties involved, see, there is a US-based company which has a subsidiary in India, uh, say in UK and in Germany, uh, say in in Germany. So now there are three. parties involved if they internally purchase and sell goods with each other and the internal offsetting is done netting is done it is called as multilateral netting so transaction between parent and subsidiary or between two subsidiaries x purchases dollar 20 million goods from y x sells dollar 30 million goods to y so net it has to take x has to take dollar 10 million from y setting settled by dollar 10 million by x receiving dollar 10 million from y multilateral netting each affiliates nets its all inter affiliate receipts against all its disbursements so p sells goods to q p sells goods to q q sells to r r sells to p through multilateral inter affiliate fund transfers are completely eliminated in this example right so it is always good to have netting as a structure internally setting receivables and payables between subsidiaries is called netting now if it comes for theory right other than example also you have to write few theory points so this is what i am discussing netting is used by mncs for opting cash flow movements netting helps minimize the total value of inter company fund flows yes because it reduces the transactions volume of transactions as a result the transaction costs are reduced as a result the accounting hassles are reduced it's always good yes to some extent this statement is correct so how reduces administrative transaction costs so i'll just highlight the main points so that you can remember coordinated internal interchange of material finished goods can take place among different units of mnc without bothering of the payment because you can internally offset them netting helps in minimizing total volume reduces number of cross border transactions reduces need for foreign exchange conversion improves cash flow forecasting since net cash transfers are made at the end of each period so i think two three points we can pick from here and we can complete our answer relating to netting because we now know what exactly it is two types multilateral and bilateral netting give the example in the exam uh, exam and come write the main points reduce administrative transaction cost reduce volume number of cross border transaction reduce need for foreign exchange conversion reduces so all of this is the positive okay next we come to the concept of main objectives uh, so according to me they may ask a question on netting fccb or adr gdr but some typical questions are also there which will also cover so international cash management now has two basic objectives one optimizing cash flow movements this we will be able to do by using the concept of netting and the other is investing excess cash so a lot of times outside in foreign subsidiaries has excess cash if there is a easy way to manage internal cash optimizing internal cash then in that case it will result into higher returns at a consolidated level always as no single strategy of international cash management can help in achieving these objectives so what are the ways of optimizing cash inflows one is that the best thing is use of netting to reduce overall transaction by eliminating number of unnecessary transactions second helps in investing excess cash so if there is any excess cash in a particular country and the other country requires it which has a better way to earn then in that case you can invest in that country we can also use transfer pricing as a methodology 
to reduce tax or minimize the tax as we know section 92 abc leading and lagging lagging strategy which is used in forex so suppose what is better strategy to lead now as in pay the importer exporter right now take a bank loan locally or we should lag it as in delay our payments so that is also one strategy that can be used managing blocked funds so if you have made say you have purchased or you have sold goods worth dollar 10 lakh now you will get the money after 3 months okay but if there is a subsidiary which has some block funds probably and you need that money so you can use that so all of this is the basic aim of optimizing international cash management meaning meaning that even though a, a subsidiary may be in us one subsidiary may be in india the other third subsidiary may be in some other country but still the tax management the cash management the cash inflows and internal outflows can be managed optimally that is the main aim optimizing cash inflow movements cash flow movements and investing access cash by using lag, leading lagging as a measure minimizing tax using transfer pricing investing excess cash netting can be done accelerating cash inflows managing block funds all of this is possible all of this is possible then next question there exists a big difference between the project be between the project and parent cash flows due to tax rate and exchange control now what does this mean this means that whether we should enter into any arrangement with the outside entities whether it is better to manage the cash flows or and the projects within the country or we should also go outside the country so for example suppose now the forex reserves are to be used if we go if we take a project outside country if there is a transaction which is happening the tax implications will be involved so all of that is to be seen here so management and royalty payments are returned to the parent firm the basis on which a project shall be evaluated depend on one's own cash flows and cash flows accruing to the parent firm or both so say for example i am in india my parent firm is in usa i will have to remit everything then is it making sense Evaluation of a project on the basis of own cash flows ensure that the project should complete favorably with domestic compete favorably with domestic firms and earn a return higher than the local competitors. If I want to internally take a project, I should earn a higher return with my domestic firms. If not, shareholders and management shall invest in equity bonds of domestic firms. Simple. So if I am getting a much better return outside my own country then definitely i should accept the project else if it is within the area within my own country then i should see check how much is the return i am getting simple project evaluation based on local cash flows avoid currency conversion so that is a benefit and eliminate problems associated with fluctuating rate exchange rates so eliminates problems associated with fluctuating exchange rate currency con conversion is avoided one then huh. own cash flow ensure that project should completely favorable with domestic firms and earn a return higher than the local competitors so that is the second point evaluation depend on one's cash flows then for evaluation of foreign project from the parents firms angle both operating and financial cash flows actually remitted to it from the yardstick. So if I am a subsidiary in India of a US parent company, how much I have remitted that will form the yardstick. For the firm's performance and basis for distribution of dividend to the shareholders and repayment of debt, an investment has to be evaluated on the basis of net after tax operating cash flows generated by the project. So it's a typical theory question. How much is the net operating cash flows that you have earned currency conversion can be avoided whether you are able to earn locally domestically better than the outside firm 
how well are you in managing tax transfer pricing tax regulation distribution of dividend is another thing that is to be taken care of all of this is the difference between parent cash flows and outside i mean uh, if you are doing business within your country and if there is a parent which is outside india and then next question how centralized cash management helps mncs in their treasury management netting the best thing so that happens a centralized cash management means say us company is the subsidiary it has india as a subsidiary us company is the parent then it has india it has say sri lanka these are the countries with it, which it has a subsidiary now where is the cash being managed at centralized level in usa in usa it this whole management is being done no how does this help maintain minimum cash balance during the year so india sri lanka they will just maintain a minimum balance and the remaining they will transfer to the parent company manage judicially liquidity requirement of the center only how much is required they will keep other than that they will transfer optimally use various hedging strategies so that mnc's foreign exchange exposure is minimized so use using netting majority of it will get offset and only a limited amount will remain to be hedged in for terms of foreign exchange maximum utilization of transfer pricing mechanism so that firm enhances its profitability so you can use your transfer pricing mechanism exploit currency movement correlation between payable receivable in different have positive correlation so for example if we feel that a particular country's currency is going to appreciate so we may transfer all our money to that particular country and currency and overall it may result into a benefit so this is how centralized cash management system helps how helps maintain minimum cash balance judicial liquidity requirement works in hedging strategies transfer pricing mechanism currency movement payable receivable all of this together is our cash management system problems faced in international capital budgeting inflation if you are engaging with a country which has a high inflation it can create a problem foreign currency issues foreign exchange risk will always be there so these are the three points you have to remember foreign exchange risk inflation and restriction at times there are restriction imposed on transfer of money within the country so transfer of profits depreciation charges technical differences exist so these are the three points you have to remember foreign exchange risk inflation restriction on transfer tax provisions held with the host country presence of tax treaties and tax discrimination by the host country between transfer of realized profit so this is what happened with vodafone it is a uk based netherlands based company which came to india did some transaction and then indian government is asking for 10000 crores in taxation so at times this taxation policies can become problematic right so tax discrimination or if tax treaties are not clear it can result into a problem right so foreign exchange risk inflation restriction imposed on transfer of profits and tax treaties tax discrimination may happen tax treaties may not be clear which can result into a big problem in terms of international capital budgeting so this is about your international financial management i hope we are clear so the the last three questions were like typical uh, typical theory ones just remember the head points which i have highlighted and you'll be through you'll be through and the next chapter that we are going to do is irrm interest rate risk management again two three places where this chapter also has few questions which may be asked first what is a swap because that's what the main chapter is all about to so swap means exchanging an asset for an asset or liability for a liability it could be in the form of shares it could be in the form of a uh, uh, derivative instruments bonds equity commodities could be anything so swap is an agreement to exchange one set of cash flows for another can be constructed for interest rate commodities bonds equities currencies what are the types of swaps the first and the foremost which is asked in our exam is basically your plain vanilla swap exchange of fixed rate loan with a floating rate loan so mr a wants a fixed rate mr b wants a floating rate but mr a has floating b has fixed okay interchanged 
and you have created a plain vanilla swap. So now you will pass on the uh, interest payments and the fixed principal to each other. Exchange of fixed rate loan to floating rate loan on notional principal is called as plain vanilla. Then second is called as the basis rate swap. Exchange of two floating rate swaps of different duration. Now, I have a... So in case of plain vanilla, everything is same. Fixed duration, uh, or same amount, same notional principle, all of that is same. So that's why it is called as a plain vanilla. Now, basis rate swap. So now I need a chocolate ice cream. I don't want a plain vanilla ice cream. So what is chocolate ice cream? So here, floating rate is swapped with a floating rate but the duration is different so mine my may be a one rate one month floating rate the other person's may be a three month floating rate when they create a swap with each other it is called as a basis rate swap now practically you wouldn't have done this because practically we just have plain vanilla for our examination but basis rate swap also can be done obviously we don't have the practical implications so for now floating rate with floating rate different durations Floating rate with floating rate, different durations will be called as a basis rate swap. Then there is an assets rate swap. Exchange of fixed rate investment with floating rate that is index. So here now instead of a typical notional principle, you are actually exchanging two assets with different or two bonds as, as the case here is with different types. As in one would be fixed rate, other would be floating rate. Right. So that will be called as a asset swap and the last is amortizing swap next in line is the amortizing swap meaning i have a fixed rate loan you have a floating rate loan i want a floating rate you want a fixed rate now we will do a swap but it will be only related to the interest i will repay my principal you repay your principal as you are repaying and I am repaying the principal. Whatever interest rate is to be paid, we will pay to each other. And that's how the amortizing swap will work. So see what they have written. Interest rate swap in which notional principal declines during the life of the swap. So notional principal or whatever is the principal will keep on declining because there is no swap for principal. But this amortizing swap is for interest. So we will keep on paying each other's interest as per whatever principal is left. All right, that is called as the amortizing swap. So four types of swaps, plain vanilla, uh, fixed rate to floating rate, simple, basis rate swap, same floating to floating, but different duration, one month, three month, asset swap, exchange of say bonds, similar to plain vanilla, but your real exchange happens in terms of principal plus interest and amortizing swap, only interest is there, principal is to be managed by own self. So these are the four types of swaps. Next, we have something called as swaption. Swaption, just a moment. Next is swaption. So what is a swaption? Swap plus option is called as swaption. So there is a call or a put option on the interest that you are going to pay gives the right to enter into an interest rate swap at a specific date and rate in future. Okay. If it is the rate is as per what you want, go ahead. Otherwise, don't pay. Fixed rate payer swaption call. Pay the fixed leg and receive the floating leg. So, that's the swap. So, you either it will be a fixed rate uh, swaption which is call or a fixed rate receiver option which is a put. So, here you will receive fixed leg and pay floating leg. Now, again, practically till the time you have not solved sums uh, will become difficult for us to interpret. Plus, this is a theory session. So, I cannot get too much into depth of it. But just to give you an idea. So, there will be a fixed rate payer swaption call which will give you a right to buy. Call is basically right to buy. So, you will pay the fixed leg, receive the floating leg. And here you will receive the fixed leg and pay the floating leg. Whichever you want, as per your convenience, you can choose. All right. So when you are paying the fixed leg, receiving the floating, it is called call. And the other way around, when you are receiving the fixed, paying the uh, floating, you will be called as a put rate swaption. Done. Next, features and uses of swaption. So at expiry, they are marked to market and just the difference is settled in cash. So you don't have to pay anything. Directly, the difference will be settled in cash. 
स्वॉप्शन पीरियड मीन टाइम सो दिस इज जस्ट डेफिनेशन फीचर सो स्वॉप्शन प्रीमियम कॉल्ड एज बेसिस पॉइंट सो ऑप्शन प्रीमियम इज ऑल्सो कॉल्ड एज बेसिस पॉइंट कैन कम इन एमसीक्यू सो ऑप्शन पीरियड मीन्स टाइम बिटवीन ट्रांजेक्शन डेट एंड द एक्सपायरी डेट सो सपोज आई डू द ट्रांजेक्शन नाउ एक्सपायरी इज थ्री मंथ डाउन द लाइन सो दैट इज कॉल्ड एज द स्वॉप्शन पीरियड सो ऑप्शन प्रीमियम दैट आई एम गिविंग इज कॉल्ड एज द बेसिस पॉइंट एट द एंड इट इज ओनली द कैश द डिफरेंशियल सेटलमेंट विच इज डन सो डिफरेंस इज सेटल्ड इन कैश यूज फॉर स्पेक्यूलेशन ऑर टू हेच बुक so as usual any derivative instrument will be used for speculation or hedging provides protection on callable bond issues because now you can either receive floating pay fixed or vice versa so you have both the options useful to borrowers targeting on acceptable borrowing rate so if you have some rate in mind and accordingly you can create your own swap option then that will be better for you so these are the uses of swap option types of interest rate risk again this is a very important concept first is gap exposure now this type of interest rate risk is usually a very important concept to be done by the banks very very important concept to be managed by the banks because all the banks which are there have to go through these risks how are you going to manage it will define your longevity and that is where cooperative banks fail because they do not they are they are not able to manage these kind of interest rate risks whereas a company like a, a bank like a hdfc or axis or icici are much used to managing this so first is gap exposure this arises between because of the difference between asset and liability suppose you have given a lot of loans so your interest sorry you have accepted a lot of deposits but you have given very little loans so you will have to pay a lot of interest as compared to the receipt so that asset liability mismanagement will result into a gap exposure so you have to pay more you are going to receive less there is a big gap gap exposure so arises from holding assets and liabilities and off balance sheet items with different principal amounts and maturity dates as well so as i told you so your loan that you have given and the deposits that you have taken they are very varied will result into a gap exposure basis risk risk of change in interest rate of assets so that is a basis risk which is always going to be there to the investor and to the bank majority of people have taken fixed a uh, loan or uh, yeah fixed loan and the fixed loan rate of interest goes down then bank will get less income in terms of interest that's a basis risk that they have embedded option risk related to prepayment of uh, you know uh, cash or loan all of that so pre payment withdrawals are categorized here so if there is a pre payment then you will need a huge amount of cash say for example you have given a loan say 10 lakh rupees loan to somebody and the ex the maturity amount is 5 years but the person comes and gives back the loan after 3 years so that is a embedded option risk because now 2 years interest you will not receive because of that pre payment so that is a embedded option risk next is yield curve risk which is dependent on the market so market bonds what rates are going on as a result of that the yield curve risk arises relates to movement in yield curves and impact on portfolio values and income then there is a price risk so if the assets are sold before they are timely maturities then it gives rise to something called as a price risk. so this is when suppose again for the banks what are their assets it is their receivables and their payables as simple as that so suppose if you there is an uh, npa okay now in case of a npa non performing asset then you may have to sell certain assets before they are stated maturities if somebody is defaulting so all of that may result into a price risk so banks must formulate policies to limit the for, uh, portfolio size holding period and duration of various asset it holds then there is investment risk reinvestment risk so what is the interest that we are going to receive on reinvestment uncertainty with regard to interest rate at which future cash flows could be reinvested is called as reinvestment risk net interest position risk so this is similar to your gap exposure so what is your net interest that whether you are getting a positive net interest you have to pay extra that is your net interest position risk when banks are more carrying assets than paying liabilities interest rate arise, arises when market interest rate risk adjusts downward so suppose if i have to pay more than i am going to receive 
so i am carrying a net interest rate risk so what are the uh, types of risks interest rate risk gap exposure basis embedded option yield curve price reinvestment and net interest position risk just go through this again two three times and it will be there in your head so this is on account of change in interest rate of assets embedded is on account of prepayment movement in yield curves is yield curve risk price risk when assets are sold reinvestment future cash flows reinvested when banks carry more assets than paying liabilities or vice versa is your net interest position risk next is asset liability management which has to be done by the banks so as per rbi governance you have to ensure a proper balance between asset and liabilities and if there is a imbalance what are the things that you have steps you have taken to manage that imbalance so alm is one of the most important tools of risk management and it is now compulsory in india as per rbi indian banking industry is exposed to a number of risks these are the number of risks that the indian banking industry is exposed to such as market risk financial risk interest rate risk etc net income is very sensitive and for this purpose rbi has introduced alm comprehensive framework for what for measuring monitoring and managing market risks of bank these are basically your market risk risks also it is the management management of structure of balance sheet liabilities and assets in such a way that the net earning from interest rate maximized with an overall risk preference we want see for a bank interest rate is what it is going to receive how you can maximize it is going to be the important thing in asset liability management so your gap exposure risks have to be managed properly so management of structure of balance sheet net earning from interest rate should be maximized with an overall risk preference alm functions extend to liquidity risk management management of market risk trading risk management funding and capital profit planning growth projections you can just learn these points where alm can be used obviously it can be used for liquidity risk management how much i am going to receive the interest how much i have to pay when the loan has to be repaid how much deposits are there with me to repay the interest management of market risk trading risk management funding capital do you have or not funding and capital planning profit planning growth projection should be in place so these are part of asset liability management and then the last is cheapest to deliver interest rate futures cheapest to deliver bond so what happens is suppose if i have taken a interest rate future in a bond right now derivatives is based on an underlying asset but suppose there is no underlying asset available but i have to square off the futures by offsetting the earlier position my god too much high level means i'll give you a simple example so that you are able to connect for example suppose for example suppose there is a bond you have entered into a long position for a bond okay or a short position for a bond so you will have to offset them now suppose if there is a short position okay obviously it has to be offset by a long position by buying it but there is a interest rate future which does not have a underlying but you will have to offset it on the closing day on the maturity by buying a bond on that particular day it is like short selling you have short sold the share right now how can you sell something which you don't have but you have short sold them how will you cover it up by buying it in the market right so that is what you are buying so when you are going to buy it you are going to buy the cheapest share in this case it is going to be the cheapest bond but when you are going to buy a bond the settlement will happen if the bond is not of a good quality suppose you are buying a bond to offset the position but the bond is not of good quality then the futures price that you are paying will be adjusted with the conversion factor which will be given in the question so futures price future settlement into conversion factor this conversion factor is dependent on the quality of bond that you are going to give minus quoted spot price of deliverable bond right seems difficult for you to interpret because you have not solved it why right? why solving is not there because again as per i say this is more relevant from theory part and there is no sum whatsoever in your module 
so that's the whole point so profit of seller of futures so future settlement price into conversion factor minus you have to settle it by giving the spot spot quoted spot price and if it is other way around then you will spell sell the current bond minus future settlement price into conversion factor this conversion factor is dependent on the quoted spot price if it's a good bond the conversion factor will be low if it's a bad bond the conversion factor will be high accordingly so that on that day the cheapest bond that you are going to purchase and settle this interest rate futures transaction is called as ctd cheapest to deliver bond so the ctd is the bond that minimizes the difference between quoted spot price of bond and future settlement price it is called ctd bond because it is the least expensive bond in the basket of deliverable bonds because i have to settle i have to buy a bond to settle it or sell a bond to settle it i will select the least expensive ctd bond is determined by the difference between the cost of acquiring the bonds from the delivery and price received by delivering the uh, by delivering the acquired bonds so this is what it is future settlement price into conversion factor minus quoted price if it's a seller of future if it's a seller of future and loss if it's if the quoted price is more then future settlement price into conversion factor the bond, bond that bond is chosen as ctd which either maximizes the profit or minimizes the loss so these are the theory things which are expected from this chapter so i have covered three chapters now in this session one is mna the other is ifm and the other is irrf all right so just go through this video once or twice again during the exam so that you are clear with the words and the concepts and then if any mcq or any question comes you are able to manage it time for me to say hasta la vista let me know in the comments anything else that you want corporate valuation for sure i know so chalo see you all in the next session till then keep smiling take care bye bye thank you so much